<coughs> Hi everyone, and welcome to Liberty Live. You know, normally, it's uh, I've, in the past I've called it Liberty Me You, but we're doing a little rebranding with our move to Adobe Connect. So this is the new space. This is I I think it's going to be a much more dynamic space for us to do you know 25 plus uh, talks every month. I think it's going to be great. I'm really excited about what we can do with this. But welcome to Liberty Live. We're here tonight with Dr. Roderick Long. Uh, Roderick is a professor of philosophy at Auburn University. He blogs at his own blog, the Austro-Athenian Empire. He also blogs at uh, Bleeding Heart Libertarians and elsewhere. He's a senior scholar for the Mises Institute, an editor of the Journal of Ayn Rand Studies, director and president of the Molinari Institute, and a senior fellow at the Center for a Stateless Society. And tonight he's going to be talking about virtue ethics, a kind of Aristotelian approach to the question of, you know, how do we get to liberty? So, uh, without further ado, Roderick Long. Oh, thanks. Uh, so, uh, you know, the libertarian movement for a long time has been divided on the question of the proper foundations, moral foundations for libertarianism. And uh, with the main di this divide being between Broadly speaking, consequentialists on the one hand, those who think that the uh, the justification for respecting libertarian rights is its consequences. Uh, this might take the utilitarian form of consequences for society as a whole. It might take uh, an egoist form of consequences for the agent, him or herself, um, or some you know, some mix of the two or something else. But the idea is that the justification for liberty is sort of causally downstream from the rights themselves or from respecting rights. It's the effects, the beneficial effects of uh, respecting liberty. On the other hand, the deontologists, um, uh, often called the natural rights position, although some natural rights theorists are egoists and it's complicated, but um, the natural rights position that uh, that certain actions are inherently wrong, like violating rights is inherently wrong in and of itself, uh, apart from any consideration of its consequences. And uh, you know, certain criticisms each side makes of the other. So, uh, you know, for example, the, um, uh, the deontologist will say, uh, look, so you consequentialists aren't really committed uh, to liberty. Uh, your commitment to liberty simply depends on your happening to think that it has these consequences, but if you can see some way to promote those consequences differently, you know, then you'd betray liberty and uh, you'd be you know, quite happy to use people as mere means to ends if you could do that. Um, and you know, the consequentialists will say, look, you deontologists are crazy. You are committed to liberty regardless of its results, so that if it turned out that uh, liberty had horrific consequences, that the libertarian society would be one that would be a nightmare of uh, civil war and poverty and mass death and so forth, and you'd still uh, be in favor of it. Also, each side accuses the other side of hypocrisy because the, the, the consequentialists will point out that the deontologists, although they say that their reasons for favoring liberty don't have to do with consequences. Nevertheless, they all seem to think that in fact liberty will have good consequences. Uh, so, um, uh, as a matter of fact, you know, the you know, most deontological libertarians subscribe to, for example, free market economic theories that say that respecting rights will tend to produce more prosperity and peace and so on. Even if they think that that's not the, the reason for uh, for favoring liberty, the, the, the fundamental reason, they nevertheless seem to sign on to it, uh, even if they describe it as, in Rothbard's words, gravy. And, and so the consequentialists think, well, there's some hypocrisy here. Really, they're crypto, the deontologists are crypto consequentialists. Really, they're smuggling in some kind of consequentialist concern in justifying uh, liberty. But of course, the deontologists can turn around and make a similar accusation against the consequentialists, which is, well, look, you consequentialists say it's the results that you favor, uh, not uh, you know, respecting personhood in its own right or something like that. But nevertheless, 
you know the uh, the values that you you hold all seem to do seem to involve respecting personhood, and you seem to uh, favor acting as though we believed in natural rights for uh, their own sake, and you try to show that consequentialism doesn't entail nasty consequences like you know sacrificing the few to the many and so forth that uh, if you're a utilitarian or sacrificing others to yourself if you're an egoist uh, the um, the consequentials try to show that their theories don't have that implication and that makes it seem as though you know there's some kind of crypto deontologists uh, so there's that worry and uh, you know, also there are some broadly speaking praxeological worries about both positions so with regard to consequentialism, here's a kind of praxeological worry about it. Now, praxeological in the sense of arising from sort of conceptual problems about the nature of uh, action. Um, so uh, one thing that seems to be generally agreed on by consequentialist libertarians is that the best way to promote good consequences is to adopt certain very general settled policies and to hold to them pretty firmly uh, and not be too ready to uh, recognize exceptions. Uh, so for people with a more utilitarian bent like Mises or Hayek or the Freedmans, um, you know, they seem to think that you, you know, if you try to follow a policy of expediency and are constantly violating uh, violating libertarian rights and anytime you see some way of gaining some social advantage for that uh, they tend to think that that will tend to be uh, you know make liberty unstable and that you should stick to these principles pretty firmly likewise if you're an egoist like Ayn Rand you're going to think that that uh, you that in order to pursue your self-interest you should commit yourself to general principles and policies and not be constantly looking for ways uh, around them uh, so uh, Libertarian consequentialists tend to be what's called rule consequentialists, not act consequentialists. That is, they tend to think that uh, consequentialism shouldn't be a criterion for determining which individual actions are correct, but rather should be a criterion simply for determining what general rules or policies or principles uh, should be followed. But there's a praxeological worry about this, which is uh, the constant uh, to you know, take a the praxeological distinction between uh, producers' goods and consumers' goods. So, consumers' goods are goods that are valued for their own sake. Producers' goods are goods that are valued for the sake of their consequences for, for producing something else. So, according to consequentialism, liberty is a producer's good. And respecting rights is a producer's good. It's valued you know, for uh, its consequences. But the rule consequential seem position seems to be that we should treat respect for rights as though it were a consumer's good. We should treat it as though we valued it for its own sake. And uh, the worry there is that either we really are valuing it for its own sake or we're just pretending. If we're just pretending, then it seems like we're not really going to be very strongly committed to the principle. We just act as though we value it for its own sake, but if we really are all the time thinking of it as a producer's good, as, as something that's valuable solely as a strategy for achieving some goal, that any time you see you know, a way of promoting the goal by violating the strategy, you're going to do it. You know, it's just like you know, following the instructions on your GPS is a generally good policy, because uh, they're usually right. But you shouldn't drive off the cliff if the GPS says there's a bridge there and there isn't one. Uh, you have to use your own judgment. So. Uh, if you think of, uh, you know, if you think of uh, principles of liberty as something like, you know, a general guideline, a rule of thumb, like, you know, do what the GPS says, then you're going to violate it any time it looks as though you can you know, produce better results. On the other hand, if you, if what consequentialism tells you to do is to treat, is really to start valuing rights as in themselves. You value them because valuing in themselves will tend to have good consequences. You should get yourself to value them for their own sake. It's like, you know, if, if there's some pill and taking a pill will make you uh, care about these things for their own sake, then you should do it. But in effect, then consequentialism is telling you to take a pill that will make you no longer be a consequentialist. 
But the problem is that once you've taken the pill, once you've gotten yourself into the right frame, frame of mind, it's not clear that you can coherently endorse consequentialism anymore. But there are praxeological worries for the deontologist, too. Um, because the deontologist says that there's some rules you need to follow, regardless of any other values you have, any other commitments you have, anything else you happen to want, all these things just seem to count for nothing in the face of these ironclad duties, these categorical imperatives, or whatever they are. And uh, that's kind of a puzzle, because praxeologically, if you value something, that commits you to pursuing it. And so how could there be some, you know, some rules that simply say you have to set aside whatever it is you value and just go after uh, you know, these rules? That's praxeologically puzzling, too. OK, so I want to talk about virtue ethics, which is a, uh, a third tradition, an alternative to both consequentialism and deontology, more or less, although there are overlaps. Um, you know, you can certainly find consequentialists try to incorporate a lot of virtue ethics into their theory. Um, I think John Stuart Mill would be an example of a utilitarian who tries to incorporate a fair bit of virtue ethics. I think Rand would be an example of an egoist who tries to do that. Um, and uh, and also, you know, you know, I think that Kant could be a deontologist who has some virtue ethical aspects too. So this isn't a hard and fast distinction. But by and large, the virtue ethics tradition focuses neither on actions in their own right as the primary criterion. You know, so that the idea that just certain actions are inherently right or wrong, certain rules just inherently you have to follow, um, and where the consequentialist instead looks at you know, causal results, the virtue ethicist focuses on moral character. And think, you know, moral character is sort of secondary for both consequentialists and deontologists. They both say, well, first we figure out what's right. You know, following the right rules, according to the deontologist, promoting the right results, according to the consequentialist, and then a person of good moral character will be whichever one actually has that result. But, you know, so the good person is defined as the one who produces those good results, or, or follows those good rules. Uh, but um, virtue ethics wants to make the question of character more front and center. So the fundamental question is, what kind of person should you be? rather than what actions should you pursue. Um, you know, so you know, if you were fans of Babylon 5, you could think of this as uh, the idea that you should answer the Vorlon question, who are you, before you answer the shadow question, what do you want? Uh, if you're not a fan of Babylon 5 or not familiar with it, then just you know, the jury is instructed to disregard that example um, rather than trying to figure it out. Uh, there are. Uh, three main traditions that are usually associated with virtue ethics. So there's the ancient Greek tradition, starting from Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, and, and extended in various ways by the Stoics and Cicero and the medieval scholastics. Um, then there's the ancient Chinese tradition, including both the Confucians and the Taoists. And then in uh, the 18th century, there's the sentimentalist tradition, of which David Hume and Adam Smith are probably the two most prominent uh, figures. Now, the particular version of virtue ethics I'm most interested in is the ancient Greek version, uh, the one that you know, basically runs from Socrates through uh, Aquinas and the later scholastics. Um, I, you know, there's a lot that I value in the sentimentalist tradition and then the Confucian and Taoist traditions, but they're not the version I mainly want to focus on today. Uh, so <clears throat> what, is, uh, what is distinctive about the, the Greek version is that it conceives virtue as part of our ultimate end. So first there's the idea that each of us has an ultimate end. Um, every action has some end or goal. And the Socratics, the Aristotelians, think that we can't coherently think of ourselves as simply having a grab bag of ultimate ends without their fitting together in some way. because we have to make trade-offs. We have to choose what to do. Um, you know, so uh, when you, you know, when you have to decide which of your ultimate ends to spend more time pursuing here and now, as opposed to which other one, uh, then you engaging in an action of deliberation, and that's a purpose of activity. It has to have an end, and that end has got to be something like a general, um, uh, a general overarching end of having all your ends fit together harmoniously, or something like that. And that's what the Greeks called. Eudaimonia, well-being, happiness, 
flourishing. Um, and the Greeks think of, of virtue, moral virtue, as being part of this, uh, this end. So, uh, you know, yeah, is virtue chosen for its own sake, or is it chosen for the sake of some further end? Well, you know, that's a question that divides the deontologists from the consequentialists, but choosing something because it's part of an end isn't quite either of those things. I mean, you're not choosing it merely as a strategy. Um, you're choosing it as an essential part. And so the question, would you still choose it if there was some other way of getting the end isn't going to come up because the end is simply is defined in terms of having these constituent parts. Um, but on the other hand, the, uh, the vir virtues aren't valued simply sort of standing independently. They're valued as part of the total, total system of everything you value. And the content of the virtues is determined by your, you know, what, what you can coherently conceive of yourself as in terms of your rational moral agency. Uh, one feature of the, uh, the Greek theory of virtue ethics is, uh, to borrow a term from uh, Douglas and Isle, uh, that it tends to stress a supply-sided or supply-side aspect of virtue. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, lots of moral theories explain why we should treat other people in certain ways by focusing mainly on facts about them and their needs. So, you know, uh, why shouldn't I treat you in such and such a way because of facts about you? Um, whereas supply-sided reasons for treating you a certain way are going to have to do with facts about me. Um, you know, so that would be, if the main reason that I shouldn't mistreat you is a fact about you, that's sort of a demand side aspect. Whereas the main reason I shouldn't mistreat you is a fact about me, it's a supply side aspect. Now, of course, any account of how I should treat you is going to take into account facts about me and facts about you, obviously. Um, you know, so any theory is going to have both supply side and demand side aspects. But the, um, uh, the Greek theory tends to uh, stress these more, uh, to stress the supply side aspects more, and uh, to say that um, the reason that I should respect your rights uh, is that dealing with other people through reason and persuasion rather than through force is just inherently a more rational and therefore more human uh, mode of acting. Now another thing that the Greek tradition uh, tends to stress is this idea of the unity of virtue. Now, this is sometimes defined as the idea that you can't have one virtue without having them all. And in Socrates' version, it was simply the view that all the different virtues are really just the same state under different names. And the Stoics more or less held that too. Uh, Aristotle doesn't hold it in that radical a form. Aristotle thinks that you can't have any one virtue completely without having all the others completely. But he thinks you can have some virtues, you know, you could have, you could be 90% courageous and only 50% uh, honest or something like that. Uh, you could have them to different degrees. It's just that having any one of them completely requires having them all. <clears throat> but the important part of the unity of virtue for me is not the claim itself, but the reason for it, which is that the content of the virtues can't be settled independently of the content of the other virtues. You can't fully settle the content of any one virtue apart from the others. Uh, no, so to take an instance of why you might think this, uh, suppose that I've borrowed something from you, so it's your property, and I'm on my way back to your house to give it back. And uh, a mugger approaches me and demands that I hand the item over. So there are two virtues that become relevant here. So the virtue of justice is the virtue of, you know, at least among other things, of respecting people's rights, of uh, you know, giving people what they are owed. And so uh, justice will, will tell me uh, you know, what I owe to you in respect of returning your property. Um, but justice doesn't necessarily say that I have to return your property at all possible costs um, because you know, justice wants to take into account you know, other considerations. It, it can't be the case that I have an obligation to return your property no matter what, especially if it's something trivial and the cost is great, you know, so, um, you know, I borrowed a bottle of lemonade from you and I'm on the way to give it back and 
if I if I refuse to hand it over to the mugger, the mugger will chop me into bits with his giant sword. Um, you know, so you might think, well, just I'm not being unjust if I hand the uh, the lemonade over. Um, so justice will tell me what uh, you know what price I you know I am obligated to pay, how much trouble I have to go through in order to return your property. Another virtue that's relevant here is courage. Courage is the virtue of you know, that determines you know, when, when and under what circumstances they should face danger. And for these Greek thinkers, it's not the case that that you should face danger, you know, no matter what, in order to be courageous. Uh, the, they generally distinguish between uh, facing dangers that are worth the risk and facing dangers that are not worth the risk. Because courage is supposed to be a, calling someone courageous is supposed to be a term of praise. And therefore, we shouldn't apply the term courageous to things that we don't admire. So is it courageous to rush into a burning building? Well, for the Greeks, it depends why you're doing it. If you're rushing into a burning building to save a loved one, then that's a risk worth taking, they would say. And so they'd call it courageous. But if you're rushing into a burning building to save your ham sandwich that you left on the ninth floor, um, then they'd say it's not a risk worth taking. So they wouldn't want to call it courageous, because that would imply an endorsement or admiration of it. Um, so courage does not say, you know, you should take you know, risks whenever they come. It says you should take those risks that are worth taking. So uh, courage will not necessarily tell me I have to resist the bugger. It will, uh, you know, it'll tell me that you know, I should resist the mugger, you know, if the risk is worth taking. And whether the risk is worth taking or not depends on two things. First, it depends on how dangerous the mugger is. It also depends on how important it is to return this property to you. So, um, you know, how dangerous the mugger is is something that sort of is independent of the question of what I owe you. Uh, it's just, you know, is this mugger actually armed? Is this mugger stronger than I am, etc.? Sorry, my uh, screen just my screen goes. Oh, I don't. It probably didn't. Nothing probably happened for you. And my screen goes dark if I don't, you know, touch the mouse periodically. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, how dangerous the mugger is is you know, is. That aspect of the, you know, is this a risk worth taking is independent of you know, any other moral considerations. But the other consideration is, uh, is you know, how, you know, how important is it for me to return my, this property to you? Because whether something is courageous or not is not determined simply by the absolute level of danger. It's the absolute level of danger given, you know, the importance of risking it. Now, that's why you can't just say, you know, it's courageous to run into a, a burning building that has you know X percent chance of, of killing you. It depends whether it's worth it or not. And so I can't fully answer the question of whether this is a risk worth taking independently of the question of what justice requires of me. But justice likewise, uh, you know, which says that I, you know, justice in effect requires me to take all reasonable steps to return your property. But what counts as a reasonable step to returning your property is going to depend on what courage requires of me. So I can't fully settle the question of what justice requires of me independent of what courage requires of me, and vice versa. Uh, and you know, so that's the reason that you can't have one virtue completely with having them all. Because you know, having complete virtue, having complete courage, would, be, would mean being pre prepared to, uh, to uh, make the right decision in any risk situation I might possibly face. And that would have to require you know, input from all the other virtues whenever they're relevant. Uh, and that's why I couldn't be 100% courageous without being 100% just. However, I could, you know, I could have a general disposition to face, uh, uh, you know, to face danger, but I might not be so good in the justice department. And so therefore, I might have more, I might have more courage than justice, according to Aristotle, even if not according to Socrates. Okay, so then if you think about consequence-oriented virtues, uh, virtues that are mainly about consequences, not solely, but mainly. So for example, the virtue of benevolence is mainly of, of focusing on producing beneficial consequences for other people. And the virtue of prudence is mainly about producing beneficial consequences for yourself. And you can think of justice as more of a deontological virtue. It's more about... Uh, you know, respecting people's rights, following certain rules, 
and virtue ethicists have always treated justice a little bit differently from the other virtues in that respect. Um, you know, you know, when Aristotle talks about justice, he suddenly talks about all these things about arithmetical proportions and geometrical proportions and all this sort of very rigid rule governed stuff that uh, doesn't to apply in the other virtues. And likewise, to switch to a different virtue ethical tradition, uh, Adam Smith says that justice is different from the other virtues because justice has much more precise rules than the other virtues. Uh, he says it's like grammar, whereas the, uh, the rules of grammar, whereas the other virtues are more like the rules of good writing style. Hume says similar things. Uh, you know, so justice is a more deontological virtue than, than uh, prudence or benevolence. But if the inner D virtue is right, then these then the content of these virtues is interentailing, uh, which means you can't fully specify the content of any one virtue independently of specifying the others. Now it's not circular because each one has some preliminary, you know, rough and ready content of its own to start with. But then you refine that and make it more precise through mutual reciprocal determination with the other virtues. So that means that Considerations of prudence and benevolence are going to play a role in shaping the content of justice. So the, um, and since those are heavily, not solely, but heavily consequentialist, that means that concern about conse other consequences for other people and for yourself are going to play a part in determining the content of justice. Uh, so that's a score for the consequentialists. But, it works the other way too. You can't fully settle the con content of either prudence or benevolence independently of the content of justice, which means that concerns about justice are going to play a role in determining what counts as a good consequence. And you know, that's why uh, someone like Socrates can say that you're better off uh, suffering injustice than committing it. Um, because what counts as a good consequence is uh, you know, determined by the content of justice, so that there are, you know, so there are going to be cases where, uh, you know, we we don't hold we we don't simply hold fixed a pre-theoretical conception of, of what counts as human benefit, and then say that justice has to be answerable to that. The um, the concept of human benefit can be revised uh, in order to make it fit justice. Now. The Stoics were people who wanted to revise the concept of human benefit pretty radically in order to fit in with their conceptions of the virtues. Um, and so that's why the, you know, and, and Socrates too, was, you know, was actually pretty close to the Stoics in all of these ways. Um, you know, as they, want, they want to uh, uh, so radically revise the concept of, of self-interest that it's impossible for anyone to be harmed by anything other than their own failure to be virtuous. Um, but that seems to be placing, a, you know, having too much of the arrows go one way and not the other. Uh, and I think Aristotle has a more plausible uh, view. Aristotle agrees that uh, the content of justice is, uh, it plays a role in shaping the content of, of self-interest, but he thinks that there are sort of common sense constraints on how far you can transform self-interest. So for him it's going to be a two-way street of what determines what. And so this gives us, uh, you know, this explains why we tend to expect good things to both be, you know, in our and other self-interest and to be sort of consistent with uh, respect uh, for personhood and that kind of thing. Um, and this offers us a way past the impasse of uh, the consequentialists versus the deontologists. Now you might wonder if this virtue ethical eudaimonistic approach is so good for libertarianism, why is it that most of the people who held this view historically had pretty unlibertarian political theories? Uh, so for example, uh, Plato and Aristotle, to take the most famous examples, both favored having a political institutions set up in order to promote virtue. Uh, you know, Plato's was you know, was more extreme this way than Aristotle's, but Aristotle's has it too. Uh, they both reject the idea of the freedom to do whatever you want as a democratic Athenian idea. Um, and they, re they reject that as sort of part of the, you know, the vulgar common view that they're rebelling against. Uh, they, uh, 
think that it's it's a mistake to think of freedom as the proper goal of politics. For them, virtue is the proper goal of politics, and they think that the the state should be set up in order to promote virtue. Uh, so, if virtue ethics, you know, why doesn't isn't this a reason then to think that virtue ethics naturally leads to some kind of virtue-oriented paternalistic politics, not to libertarianism? Well, here's what I would say to that. I think that when the Greek virtue ethicists make these political conclusions, um, and they don't all do it equally so, but when they do it, I think they're ignoring some of their own principles. Um, they are forgetting the, what I called earlier, the supply side aspect of ethics, that, that uh, term I borrowed from Doug Denial, although I think he's also guilty of this. Uh, he and Doug Rasmussen in their uh, their series of books. Um, uh, what um, uh, anyway? So what what Plato and Aristotle do is they start thinking that uh, that given this orientation toward virtue, that means that the purpose of the state should be to promote the virtue of the people in it. So that if I am a decision maker in the state, my goal should be to act in ways that will make the citizens more virtuous. Um, but that's a demand side uh, approach, and you know it's fine as far as it goes. You know, there's nothing wrong with you know, with uh, taking into account you know, what ways in which political institutions you know, tend to promote virtue. But what it's ignoring is uh, how my own virtue as a political decision maker uh, is affected by how I treat other people. So if I am imposing other pe uh, uh, things on other people by force. If I'm dealing with them through force rather than through reason and persuasion, then uh, that's a, going to be a problem with my own virtue and that's with my own flourishing. Um, and so uh, even if I could uh, promote your virtue by forcing something on you and therefore by promote your well-being, it seems if you're going to be a strict and consistent uh, sort of supply-side oriented eudaimonist, that you're concerned for your own flourishing. You're concerned to live a more human life, a life of dealing with others with, with, via reason and persuasion rather than force would be uh, in your interest. And you know, by the same token, I think that uh, Doug Denial in his, in his book with, in his series of books with Rasmussen, uh, they tend to treat rights as uh, ways of protecting people's flourishing. So again, that's sort of a demand side way of thinking about rights, which I think is a uh, you know, is in tension with with uh, Doug Denial's supply side idea. If the um, uh, if the if the reason I should respect rights is is mainly because doing that allows you to flourish, that's more of a demand side conception. And of course, there's room for that. That's part of the story. But for a Greek oriented view, that seems like a, a more fundamental reason should be that I'm violating my own. Uh, flourishing by violating your rights because by dealing with you through violence rather than through reason I am uh, you know, I'm degrading my own nature I'm not living up to a truly human uh, way of thinking and you know sometimes the you know these Socratic thinkers will will say that um, you know Aristotle for example raises the question uh, you know would it be appropriate for someone to try and become a dictator in order to promote lots and lots of virtuous results? And he says no, because they would you know, they would undermine their own virtue by doing so. So I mean, they they, they'll, they will say the right kinds of things, but um, but I think they sometimes tend to lose track of that um, because they you know, they think that if virtue is the <clears throat> focus of their moral theory, then it has to be uh, the goal of um, of the political system. And also, of course, another problem is that a lot of these thinkers didn't really have a strong distinction between society and state. Um, now, I think that the Athenian Democrats sort of did, um, you know, not quite the way we'd want them to, but they, you know, they did draw a distinction between society and state. Uh, but the, um, I think that a lot of the philosophers tended to think that if you treat the state as merely sort of a convenient tool for protecting one another from injustice, uh, then you're in effect treating society that way too, and you're thinking that the only purpose of, so of societal relations is as a kind of mutual non-aggression pact. The view that Glaucon 
sort of grudgingly defends in the second book of Plato's Republic. Um, in other words, they tend to think that if, if the state is an artificial contrivance, then society would have to be too. And since they think that society you know, is more something we're organically connected with, they think that the state has to be too. But again, I don't think that follows from any of their uh, principles. OK, so why don't we move to the Q&A slash discussion uh, section of this. Uh, however that works. All right, if you'd like to ask questions, you can ask in, um, in the Q&A tab above the chat window. Uh, let's try this. Uh, OK, our first question is from Corey Massimino. How does acting rationally, our ultimate end, and it entail acting virtuously? Okay, well, the argument that Aristotle gives is that if something is your ultimate end, then you want to, then it seems like you should want to do it well. So if your ultimate end were to play the violin, it would be sort of weird to have your whole life organized around playing the violin would be satisfied with just sort of barely scratching out some kind of a half-assed tune on it. it. Seems as though if something is your ultimate goal, you should want to do it well uh, or excellently. Now, the Greek term for excellence and the Greek term for virtue are the same thing, uh, arete. Um, but of course, not all virtue is moral virtue. So, even if it's part of our goal to do something excellently, how is that going to uh, you know, get us to the moral virtues? Well. Aristotle tends to think of the moral virtues as being a, involving having the right emotional responses to things. So the, the emotions for Aristotle are not just raw feelings. Um, they are, sorry, I, and they are tools of cognition. Um, they embody judgments, value judgments. And uh, if, you're, you know, if you've got your, uh, you know, your head working right, they will, or your heart working right if you're in Aristotle, because the head's just a refrigerating tool, according to him. Um, uh, anyway, if you've got your cognitive organs working right, then they will, uh, they will be reliable. And what the virtues seem to do is to, uh, to track our, more, our emotional responses onto what is the most truly human way of living. So Aristotle always is concerned with avoiding falling into two kinds of extremes. So in this case, Aristotle says, we should not try to live the life of a beast or a god. What does he mean by that? Well, if you try to live the life of a beast, that means you're living a life that doesn't engage your fully human side. Um, and uh, you know, therefore, it's not really our life. It's the life of sort of a lower aspect of us. So that's one kind of mistake you can make. The other kind of mistake you can make is trying to live too godlike a life, focusing on ourselves as though we were simply something like disembodied intellects and ignoring our, uh, our embodied vulnerable nature. So Aristotle tends to think that Socrates and Plato are making the godlike mistake. That uh, you know, when they say it's impossible for a virtuous person to be harmed, they're ignoring the importance of our vulnerable embodied animal side. But then people who are, you know, who are cowardly and afraid to face danger, or people who are too stingy, are going to be people who, um, uh, who are overvaluing their animal side. So Aristotle thinks that it's possible that it's possible to have sort of rational emotions, emotions that embody the correct rational judgments, and those are going to be the ones that most fully express uh, our being human. That was uh, quite an answer. Now, how do your conclusions on uh, on this virtue ethics approach? Uh, uh, how do they relate to uh, the conclusions of uh, Jeffrey Plochet in his dissertation? Well, um, you know, our views are, are pretty similar. It's been a while since I read his dissertation, so I've forgotten. I remember we disagreed about something, but I can't remember what. Um, so uh, that wasn't a very interesting answer, but uh, yeah, we are. We are on uh, you know, similar projects. Uh, Astrid asks, how does this approach to ethics take post-structuralism and modern sociology into account? 
and it looks like there was going to be more to that question, but it got cut off. OK, well, um, the different things that question might mean, but probably you know, one thing it might mean is that uh, post-structuralism gives us uh, a kind of worry about essentialist conceptions of human nature. So if you think that an Aristotelian account assumes that there's some definite fixed biologically given human nature that's normative for us. And then if you take the arguments of people like Foucault, according to which there isn't uh, any kind of um, uh, sort of given, or Sartre for that matter, um, although Sartre's sort of an odd case, um, you can see sort of Foucault trying to do to Sartre what Sartre did to everyone else. That is, you know, Sartre says, you know, we don't have any definite nature. It's just, you know, it's just, you know, this freedom to be whatever, but then that sort of turns into a kind of human nature for him. And you can see Foucault has been kind of critical of that and thinking that there's more role for social construction there. Um, what I'd want to say is that I think it's a mistake to think of uh, human nature in the Aristotelian sense as being sort of biologically given, uh, you know, just sort of something is provided by our meat. I think it's more of a praxeological uh, conception. It's you know, what conception of ourselves can we make uh, sense of? Um, now, the fact that we are embodied meat is going to be relevant, and the fact that we are intellectual, rational beings is going to be relevant to what kind of conception of ourselves we can make sense of. But I don't think it's something we can just read off of biology. It's something we, that we get through rational deliberation. And I think there's a, you know, there's a role for social construction. I think you know, the self is in some ways socially constructed. But there are limits to how the self can be socially constructed, not just every way of socially constructing things is possible. So to take an analogy, money is a social construct. And you can't read the nature of money just simply off, you know, you can't just look at some gold and say, aha, that's got to be money. Um, you know, depends. Different societies use different things uh, for money. Some things are more suitable for money than others. Uh, so, um, you know, for example, there are there are places in Africa where they use camels as money. It seems they're not ideal. It's not good. For, you know, they don't they don't they don't keep as well. Um, and, you know, you don't you know if you just put them in a storehouse, you come back, it'll be dead. Unlike the gold, which won't have changed. And it's hard to make change with a camel. But you know, it's doable. You know, you can you don't you know, you can make change by just handing over a certificate that represents a portion of the camel rather than actually handing over the portion of the camel, and it's doable. But you know, there's some there are limits to what kinds of things we could use as money. Uh, you know, I used to always say you can't use clouds as money, and this is before the term cloud kept meant what it meant now, the data cloud, and maybe you know maybe Bitcoin is using clouds as money. But I mean, sort of you know the clouds. You know, the old-fashioned kinds of clouds, the water vapor up there in the sky that floats around, we can't use it as money um, because, you know, there's, you know, there's no way to transfer it or control where it goes or anything. Um, so although money is a social construct, A, it is physically embodied, you know, the things that are money are physical things, and B, there are limits on what kinds of, what kinds of social construction we can do. So, uh, you know, so I want to... I want to honor both the essentialists and the anti-essentialists as being each being partly right, which is, uh, you know, I've, I've been told that my, my position is that people who are right and people who are wrong are both saying the same thing. So I guess I'm living up to that today. <laughs> uh, and the, uh, the second part that got cut off, uh, Astrid made the comment that virtue ethics seems to rely on a bizarre concept of the self. Do you have any what? thoughts on that? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what the bizarre uh, conception is. Um, I'd like to uh, put out a call for more questions here, but in the meantime, I'll uh, let people know what we've got going on next week here at Liberty Me or uh, Liberty Me Live. I'm gonna, it's gonna take a little while for me to uh, switch the branding in my head. Uh, Sunday night. Uh, Jeffrey Tucker will be continuing his Liberty Classics series with the use of knowledge and society by uh, F.A. Hayek. Uh, Monday night, uh, G.P. Manish will uh, start his series on economic calculation and socialism. 
Tuesday night, we've got Larry Reed from Fee. He'll be talking about a student's essay that changed the world. That's going to be a really fun talk, so I definitely recommend that. Uh, Wednesday night, Mike and and his uh, Mike DeBaggio and his wife Shell will be talking about the book they did together, House of Refuge, which is free to Liberty Me members. Um, and then Thursday, we've got the second session of Jeffrey Tucker's series on the man of the century, Mises and his works, and then the start of another really fun course. I think it's going to be seven sessions uh, with Zach Slayback. It's called Love, Hate, and the State, an introduction, uh, introduction to the moral psychology of politics. So it's going to be a great week next week here at Liberty Me Live. So I look forward to seeing you all. Uh, we've got more questions. Uh, Corey Massimino uh, asks, according to virtue ethics, are there exceptions to the non-aggression principle and why? OK, so uh, you know, I mean, according to virtue ethics, well, I mean, virtue ethics as such doesn't take a stand on it. There are many different flavors. So I guess the, really the question is, according to my version of virtue ethics, uh, are there? Um, no, but asterisk, uh, I think that the, the various moral concepts that we use, uh, justice, rights, benevolence, aggression, and so forth, are going to be interdefined, and their content is, uh, is um, you know, determined by, you know, by these mutual relationships. And so the content of aggression is, to some extent, going to be determined by these other values. Of course, these other, the content of the other values is also going to be determined by the content of aggression. So it's not the case that the concept of, of aggression becomes infinitely elastic and, uh, and so on. But nevertheless, I think that, for example, you know, so take a concrete example. So the question of, um, you know, do you get to steal something if you're starving? And is that, if you, if you do, is that an exception to the non-aggression principle? What I would want to say is that, uh, Yes, you do get to steal if you're starving. You thereby acquire a duty uh, to compensate the person or to make reasonable efforts to compensate the person where possible. I want to say that in that case, there, your stealing is not aggression. What would be aggression is to steal without accepting the duty to compensate. So I think that the, you know, the content of exactly what the non-aggression principle asks of us is, res is responsive to these other values. But it's you know, but it also you know, it it pulls you know, it pulls uh, in the others in its own direction uh, as well. So that, uh, you know, for example, uh, although my concern with uh, you know, prudence in this case uh, of I'm starving, um, my concern with my self-interest is in this case shaping the contours of the concept of aggression. It works the other way too that my concept of, of, my, of what's in my self-interest may have to be revised in order to, uh, to uh, meet uh, requirements of what counts as aggression. Great answer. Uh, our next is a question that I had myself, but Reagan asked, uh, what's the best way to get up to speed on this subject? Uh, could you recommend some books or essays that would get somebody to where they under, understand what you've already said in this lecture. OK, let's see. Um, well, Jeff Plochet's uh, dissertation that was mentioned earlier, oh, as I said, my, my memory of it is, is vaguer than I'd like it to be. But uh, I think that would, that's online, I believe. It used to be. Um, would be useful. Um, uh, let's see. Um, well, actually, um, a few years ago, I gave a, uh, a week-long seminar at the Mises Institute that I'm in the course of transcribing, and I'm going to release it as a book in the next couple of months. Um, so, and, and that contains some of the stuff I've just been talking about. Um, uh, there are, there's an essay by Julia Annas, A-N-N-A-S, called Happiness as Achievement. Um, they would recommend. And also, there's an article by Rosalind Hursthouse, H-U-R-S-T-H-O-U-S-E, called Virtue Theory and Abortion. 
And I don't find what she says about abortion particularly interesting. I don't either strongly agree with it or strongly disagree with it. But in the course of setting up the issue of abortion, she says some really interesting things about the nature of virtue ethics. Um, you know, so I think that, you know, so the Annis piece and the Hearst House piece are good introductions to the, you know, to something like the view I'm talking about. And I've linked to a couple of those in the chat below there. Uh, Jeff's dissertation and then the uh, Annis piece and then I'll work on the others. But uh, our next question is from, from uh, NP. Your personal thoughts on the usefulness of the trolley problem? Um, I'm neither one of the great lovers of those problems nor one of the great haters of them. Um, the, you know, so here's, let me see what's, what's good and bad about them. I think that uh, you know, weird thought experiments have their value because principles have uh, you know, counterfactual implications. Uh, if you're committed to a principle, that means you're committed to doing certain things in various possible conceivable situations. And so if your moral principle has an upshot that in, uh, in some weird situation you ought to do X, but if it seems to us in reflection that, that we really want to say that in a weird situation we ought not to do X, then there's an interesting conflict between you know, our moral intuition and this principle, and we have to think about how to resolve it. So these weird, um, you know, these weird situations have their uses, and that's why, you know, to take one of the earliest examples in the history of philosophy um, of a weird example, you have, um, once again, book two of Plato's Republic, where Plato introduces this notion of Gyges' ring, a magic ring that turns you invisible, so you can go around killing people and stealing stuff and so on without being caught as a way of severing uh, unjust behavior from its usual bad effects on reputation and so forth. So that for those who thought that the, you know, as Glaucon had suggested, not fully endorsing the view, but suggesting it as a likely possibility that the reason to be just is that a general practice of being just tends to attract uh, rewarding behavior from others, sort of, you know, uh, you know, axelrod before his time kind of thing. Um, you know, this suggests some worries about that approach. Um, the downside of things like the trolley problem is that often there's a tendency, you know, rather than thinking about these, these, uh, these cases and how they interact with general you know, moral principles and arguments about those, there's often a tendency to just sort of focus on the, the problems in isolation from all other moral considerations and just have some kind of gut reaction to the problem and then say, all right, well, I'm going to treat my gut reaction to this problem as sort of decisive for resolving uh, these ethical questions. Whereas I want to say, well, you know, your gut reaction to the trolley problem is not decisive. Um, uh, the, uh, you know, I think there's a kind of balance between general principles and particular cases. And if there's a conflict between the particular, the particular case you find most plausible and the general principle you find most plausible, then there's room for mutual adjustment, but it's not the case that one of the side automatically wins. So some people say, well, you should stick to the general principle no matter what crazy conclusions it turns out to have. And the other view would say, no, we have to save all our particular intuitions no matter what the general principle uh, uh, turns out to be. And I think that both of those are wrong. I mean, sometimes our gut reactions are wrong. Our gut reactions can be shaped by all kinds of prejudices. I mean, uh, you know, when Cicero is thinking about moral problems, he comes up with the question, uh, is it okay for, um, uh, you know, for a slave to kill his master and escape? And Cicero thinks, well, no, of course not. Um, yeah, and, uh, you know, whereas, you know, if you follow some general principle, and Cicero's general moral principles uh, about treating other people with respect and so forth would naturally tend to condemn slavery. But he has this particular judgment in favor of slavery that he just takes for granted because he lives in a slave society and benefits from it. Um, so I don't think that our, our particular judgment should always automatically trump things. On the other hand, I think they have some weight. So once again, it's a matter of mutual adjustment. Our next question is from Ryan Troyer. He asks, does your version of virtue ethics say anything about aesthetics and the arts? I think that, I don't know whether this is exactly part of virtue ethics, but I think that there are some 
uh, some similarities. And um, you know, the branch of virtue ethics that's done the most to talk about those similarities is not the Greek version so much as the you know the 18th century version. So people like uh, David Hume and Adam Smith and uh, Francis Hutcheson and uh, Edmund Burke developed theories of aesthetics that were explicitly modeled on their theories of ethics. Um, now their version of virtue ethics I partly like and partly don't, but I think there are some. Uh, you know, I think there are some connections. Uh, the uh, you know, one thing I like about the Greek version of virtue ethics, and it's something that I think that the 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 18th century sentimentalists were going for, but didn't always achieve, is the way in which uh, judgments, value judgments, can be objective without being judgments of some kind of uh, you know, radically transcendent things that are completely d disconnected from you know from the human. Now, you know, Plato would be an exception there. Plato obviously thinks that that there is such a thing as the form of beauty that has nothing to do with us or our lives and just exists in its own right. But, um, but I think that uh, uh, you know, some of the things that you know, some of the things that Smith and Hume say about you. Know, so Hume has this essay called on the standard of taste. Um, and uh, Burke, I don't often cite Burke favorably, but uh, uh, Burke has this essay on this, as an essay on the sublime and beautiful um, and the opening thing on, on taste. I mean, it's very psychologistic. It's all about facts about our, you know, our human psychological tendencies to value things. And I, uh, you know, that I'm not such a big fan of, but he, makes the point that uh, there isn't as much divergence in aesthetic taste as we might think there is. Um, so for example, you might think that um, uh, you know, if, if two people read the same poem and one person loves it and one person hates it, you might think, well, clearly we have a basic difference in taste there. But that might not be the case, because suppose I read you a poem in a language you don't know, then if you don't get anything out of it, it's not a sign of a difference in taste. It's because you don't, um, uh, you know, it's because you don't know it. Or, um, you know, take a less radical example. You know, suppose you read some story that's full of inaccuracies. It might be historical inaccuracies or technical inaccuracies or something. So it might be you're reading a detective story and it says, you know, that the detective, you know, jammed another clip into his revolver. And if you know anything about guns, you think, what does that mean? Um, and it might interfere with your enjoyment of the story. Um, if you don't know anything about guns, then it doesn't bug you. Or the example Burke gives is um, uh, if you, um, you know, if you're reading a story that talks about people being shipwrecked on the sea coast of Bohemia, and of course that's a reference to uh, a Shakespeare play. Um, if you know that Bohemia doesn't have a sea coast, that may bug you. But if you don't know that, it won't. And so, uh, you know, in that case, there's simply a difference in knowledge. Um, so I think in a lot of cases of aesthetic disagreements, it's cases where uh, a lot of disagreements are, is, is the matter of what people are paying attention to. It's not simply uh, purely subjective. I'm not sure how direct an answer that is. It didn't particularly connect with the virtue ethics. But. Um, our next question is from Chris Hudson. Chris asks, what has been your experience discussing ethics with left anarchists? Uh, such as social anarchists, is there normally a good overlap with different conclusions? Um, well, social anarchists, uh, it's not always clear to me what their, you know, what their ethical theories uh, are, um, because they, you know, a lot of them just sort of tend to be suspicious of lots of traditional ethical ways of uh, of talking, um, uh, so uh, you know, most of my discussions with left anarchists and social anarchists have been at a more, you know, at a more intermediate level, not at the basic level of ethical foundations. the The closest thing, you know, it's someone who's a you know, an individualist anarchist, but has some roots in the social anarchist scene, would be William Gillis, with whom I 
share a lot of uh, agreements when it comes to sort of conclusions, but when it comes to ethical foundations, we agree on almost nothing. He's uh, uh, sort of a radical utilitarian who, for whom the utilities are are for degrees of freedom rather than anything to do with individual persons. And so, if we were all if we were all merged into a giant hive mind that achieved great freedom, that then, then we would have, be obligated to bring that about. Uh, I mean, he said that. That's not my parody of his view. That's his view. Um, but I don't know whether he would he counts as a social anarchist uh, or not. But he's someone who who has more background in that milieu than most of the people I interact with. He doesn't even like to be called a uh, leftist, G even though he's more leftist than I am. <laughs> <laughs> Jason asks, what are your thoughts on Alastair McIntyre and his particular formulation of virtue ethics? Yeah, well, he's he's um, someone I was influenced by a fair bit in college, though I also you know, resisted a fair bit uh, as well. So uh, McIntyre has this idea that the problem with modern moral philosophy is that uh, with the collapse of the Aristotelian worldview, we lost the idea of, a, of human nature as having a goal or a telos. And now, uh, at least in After Virtue, uh, I'm not as familiar with you know, his more recent stuff, so I'm going by the book that influenced me the most. In After Virtue, he, you know, He's, he rejects sort of biological essentialism. He doesn't think that we, there is any sort of naturally given end. And so he thinks that the end has to be given by social traditions. Um, and of course, I want to find an intermediate way between those uh, options. Uh, so he thinks that our social traditions give us these social roles. Actually, it's, it's, it's very Confucian in a way. The social conditions, uh, traditions give us these social roles, and these social roles define what the telos or goal is for us. And then the virtues are going to be the virtues that uh, that make uh, a life shaped in accordance with that telos uh, uh, work out. So, you know, I liked a lot of what he said about the structure of moral theory, but I didn't agree that it had to be quite so based on traditions uh, as uh, it is, is. But as I said, this is based on after virtue. I know that he got uh, more Thomistic later, and I don't know whether that's whether the changes are for good or ill or both. Probably both, but just a safer guess. Well, thank you so much for that answer and all the others and for giving this talk tonight. It's been tremendously informative. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, we hope to have you back, Dr. Long. Thanks so much. Take care, everyone. Have a great night. Okay, thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone, and thanks for bearing with our uh, technical problems for our first night on Adobe Connect. I've been reading, I've been, with one eye, I've been reading all these chat things. <laughs>